Good afternoon. Thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Brittany Howell and my colleague Lori and I will be managing this session. We're fortunate to be joined today by Game Commission employees Dan Lynch, a wildlife education specialist, and Matt Tehan, a state game warden, as well as Zach Baer from the U.S. Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services. They will be explaining what homeowners and farmer, farmers can do to try to alleviate some of their problems with wildlife. We expect this presentation to last about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 minutes. You can ask a question by typing into the quest type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel at the right of your screen. For those of you dialing in to listen by phone, please note that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive long distance charges from your service provider. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to our presenters. Uh, welcome. Uh, this uh, webinar is designed to be a very brief overview of things that homeowners and farmers can try to do to alleviate some of their problems with wildlife. Uh, we won't be able to cover every situation involving wildlife, but there is a tremendous amount, amount of information available on both the Game Commission and USDA Wildlife Services websites. I have a little technical difficulty here. Go ahead. All right, so all wildlife is protected. Certain animals can be removed if they are causing damage to crops, property, or people. Many of Pennsylvania's fur bear populations have increased significantly as market prices for pelts have dropped. This has led to increases in the number of opossums, raccoons, skunks, and beavers, even mink and coyotes in many areas. In addition, Expanding communities and new rural housing developments are placing more and more homes right on the doorstep of thriving wildlife habitats. As a result, deer, bears, groundhogs, squirrels, and a myriad of songbirds are becoming increasingly comfortable hanging out in backyards and similar places. Wildlife problems are compounded by people who draw wildlife into residential areas with feeders and improperly stored garbage. Homeowners who have free-range chickens and other poultry also have issues with wildlife. These can usually be countered by penning up these animals, especially at night. It doesn't help communities where hunting and trapping cannot be pursued within their limits because of safety, safety zone limitations or other restrictions. That unfortunately leaves most population control work to wildlife pest control agents. More often than not, it's going to cost you time and probably money to alleviate a wildlife nuisance problem. In a lot of situations, though, homeowners can help themselves. They simply need to be armed with the right information and equipment to get the job done. But before you head out to your property and start eliminating unwanted critters, let's talk about some of the common problems and possible solutions. One of the most common uh, wildlife problems Pennsylvania homeowners face is garden raiding. The culprits are usually rabbits, groundhogs, and deer. But occasionally a raccoon or a bear will drop in for things like sweet corn and berries. Inexpensive solutions include using scarecrows, hanging pie tins, and spraying peppery liquids on plants. But animals will adjust to these tactics. Many home gardeners also place fences around their gardens. But if animals climb over or dig under a fence, you may have to consider setting a live trap to apprehend your raider. Live traps come in a variety of sizes, and most are designed to lure the animal into the cage. And as they step on a trap, all the door closes behind them. These traps are ideal for residential areas because if you catch the neighbor's pet by mistake, all you have to do is open the door to release the dog or cat from the trap. Troublesome rabbits and squirrels uh, can be relocated to another area. However, anyone who sets one of these traps must recognize it has the potential to catch, some, catch something other than he or she that what he or she may have ever expected, namely a skunk. The problem, of course, is what to do with the skunk. It's liable to spray just about anyone who comes near the trap, even if the person is just trying to set it free. Since skunks, as well as raccoons, bats, groundhogs, foxes, and coyotes are rabies vector species, they should not be relocated like other wildlife. Homeowners who set traps and catch these species face the choice of killing the animal or releasing it. Releasing a skunk or raccoon can be a risky situation. There's a chance you could be sprayed by the skunk or bitten or scratched. What follows promises to be an unpleasant situation. You either have to be deodorized or anxiously await the test results on the trapped animal's brain tissue to determine if it's rabid. Because of this risk factor, 
Many people who feel insecure about dealing with these animals should contact a professional and have the job done safely, humanely, and legally. The big thing is that you being if you're prepared. Before you set a trap to resolve a wildlife conflict, you have to ask yourself these questions. Are you prepared to kill the trapped animal? Do you know how many have properly disposed of an animal carcass? Do you know how to release a trapped animal? Do you know what bait should be used to ensure you catch a targeted species? And do you know how frequently you must check a trap to set uh, capture wildlife? A person should put a great deal of thought into any plan that calls for using a trap to re resolve a nuisance wildlife problem. Getting and setting the trap is the easy part. Dealing with what happens after the door closes, however, truly can be more than most homeowners bargain for. If you can answer yes to the aforementioned questions, then you should know what you're getting into when you set a trap. Landowners and homeowners may not trap beavers, bobcats, migratory birds, big game, threatened species, or endangered species. Once traps are set, they must be checked daily. Wildlife taken alive may not be retained alive, sold, or given away. Live wildlife must be relocated to a natural setting on private property with permission. Any wildlife killed due to property damage or nuisance must be reported to the Game Commission within 24 hours. Wildlife also has a habit of establishing homes under our sheds, in the banks of our ponds, even in our houses. These intrusions can range from bats or flying squirrels in the attic to chipmunks under the sidewalk and songbirds nesting in your hanging fuchsia or prized rosebush. Sometimes it's rewarding to have wildlife living on your property because it can be fun to watch. But that enjoyment can change quickly when wildlife begins to invade your living quarters, causes significant property damage, or has a close, uncomfortable encounter with people around your home. Lane owners should contact the region office that serves the county where they are located before trapping nuisance wildlife. And all the numbers uh, in Pennsylvania for the Game Commission are listed on the slide. In addition to giving you advice about how to handle nuisance complaints on your own, Game Commission dispatchers can also provide you with phone numbers for wildlife pest control control operators in your area. Um, wildlife pest control operators are permitted by the Game Commission to handle wildlife complaints and do charge for their services. Depending on the type of nuisance wildlife, if you can wait till hunting and trapping seasons open, you may be able to find someone who is properly licensed to do it for you for free. Another agency, agency that specializes in, in wildlife night, nuisance problems for both landowners and farmers is USDA Wildlife Service. Services. I'm not going to turn the program over to Zach Baer from USDA Wildlife Services. Hi, my name is Zach Baer, and I'm a wildlife biologist with the USDA Wildlife Services. I'd like to open uh, with a quick background about who the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services are and how we operate. Uh, we are a federal wildlife agency. We were formed by the Animal and Damage Control Act of 1931. We're part of the Animal and Health Plant inspection service under USDA, and that's what APHIS stands for. We are non-regulatory, unlike the Game Commission, therefore we do not enforce wildlife laws. We are comprised of state and multi-state programs, therefore there are staff available in each state to help uh, residents and landowners with wildlife damage problems. Uh, we have operations and research programs, and we are also an emergency response agency meaning that staff can be required to assist with natural disasters such as oil spills, hurricanes, or disease outbreaks. One of the main things uh, the USDA Wildlife Services does is provide free technical assistance, and that is available to anyone having wildlife damage issues. We can provide information over the phone to assist individuals, communities, and businesses so they can legally resolve their wildlife damage problems. Uh, on the slide here, you can see some pictures, uh, an illegal set conibear bear trap, a pole trap for a hawk, hunting over bait. These are all um, things that we would never suggest to uh, private landowners. More information uh, regarding technical assistance is uh, we can assist landowners with applying for federal depredation and state permits. Uh, in the slide there, you can see that pink colored form uh, that's our Wildlife Services Form 37, and that is required uh, by a homeowner or landowner to obtain a depredation permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to remove damaging migratory birds legally on their own. 
Uh, another common issue when we provide technical assistance um, is complaints from homeowners, and uh, a lot a lot of times those complaints result uh, revolve around supplemental feeding. Wildlife Services always discourages the feeding of wildlife as it can add to your problems. It can increase disease transmission. It uh, can increase the risk of human injury. And in some cases, it can actually harm the animal or cause death. Besides technical assistance, Wildlife Services also provides the service of direct control. Direct control is when Wildlife Services is hired to assist in solving wildlife damage problems. As I said earlier, technical assistance is a free service, but if a landowner can't resolve the problem on their own or, unwill or are unwilling to try to do so, they can hire wild the USDA Wildlife Services. Um, we do recoup costs for our services, however. Um, one of the main things we work with here in Pennsylvania is uh, damage from Canada geese. When managing geese, we use the following, um, we use an integrated approach that involves using multiple techniques to solve the problem. Wildlife adapt, adapt well and using the same technique over and over often becomes ineffective. It's important to switch up techniques and use all resources available. Wildlife services also encourages hunting whenever it's safe and legal to do so. Hunting is a great tool to assist in resolving wildlife damage. Feeding of wildlife is never recommended and oftentimes is the reason wildlife has become a problem in the first place. Harassment, hazing, or chasing away wildlife on your own property is totally illegal. If you want to harass geese on property other than your own, you would need a nuisance wildlife control operator license to do so. Effective harassment techniques for Canada geese can include, but are not limited to, pyrotechnics, lasers, boats, and dogs. Nest and egg management is a population management tool preventing goose eggs from hatching. This can be done by shaking the eggs, oiling them with corn oil, or freezing the eggs, and then placing the eggs back in the nest. A landowner must register with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service prior to conducting any nest and egg management. Lethal reinforcement would be a last resort tool when geese have not responded to continued non-lethal harassment efforts and are continuing to cause an, accept, an unacceptable amount of damage. And finally, Roundups uh, would require a permit and we be, would be conducted during the summer months when the geese molt and are unable to fly. Um, they can be rounded up into a corral and then removed from the site. Uh, the picture on the bottom right of the slide there you're looking at is um, an example of a, a successful roundup that we, we performed last summer. Uh, damage from black and turkey vultures, believe it or not, is the fastest growing problem to landowners and farmers over the last five years in Pennsylvania. Uh, calls regarding vulture, vultures are the most common calls we receive in our offices each year. Uh, the main uh, damage concerns regarding vultures are that they're just a general nuisance. They have an ominous presence around homes, schools, and businesses. Uh, disease concerns and unpleasant odors regarding their droppings. And um, most importantly is property damage. Um, vultures have an infatuation with anything made of rubber, vinyl, or plastic. They also like to tear shingles off roofs. Um, they love to tear your windshield wiper blades off your vehicles, pool covers, grill covers, et cetera. And we also get calls each year, um, typically during calving season for, for cattle farmers where black vultures actually will sometimes predate small calves. Some solutions to um, solving your vulture damage would be, once again, using that integrated approach, sw switching up your techniques. Um, harassment, once again, things like pyrotechnics and lasers can be very effective. Um, exclusion at roost sites, wires and nets are all things that would help uh, do that. Once again, removing food sources, carcasses, carcass piles, outside pet food, after birth, all those things are attracting to vultures and you'd wanna get rid of those. Um, lethal reinforcement or removal of the problem birds um, are an option, but they would require a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Effigy deployment would also require a permit, and uh, effigies are taxidermist mounted vultures that we can hang upside down with the wings spread out near a roost site. 
Um, typically, the vultures leave the area within a couple of days as they don't like seeing their own kind hanging from a tree. FG deployment is a very effective non-lethal technique to reduce vulture-related damages. And then in some cases, uh, we can actually do vulture trapping. This would be um, a rare situation where there'd be an extremely large roost where we need to take um, a large number of vultures out of an area. So those are two of the main species we deal with as vultures and geese here in Pennsylvania. But um, other projects, programs, and species Wildlife Services works with in Pennsylvania include airports, landfills and transfer stations, white-tailed deer damage, starling damage at dairy farms, coyote damage, aquaculture damage, rabies management, wildlife disease, feral swine management, woodpecker, woodpecker damage to residential buildings, groundhog damage, beaver damage, invasive species capture, and damage to fruit and grapes at vineyards or orchards. And here's some contact information um, for us. This is our contact information for our Eastern District Office in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, we also have field offices scattered throughout the state, and our state office is located in the Farm Show Building in Harrisburg. Um, we're happy to assist with any of your wildlife damage issues, and you can feel free to contact us with any wildlife-related questions you need, and we can provide that free technical assistance for you. All right, thanks, Zach. Um, so um, that's kind of concludes our nuisance wildlife webinar. And Brittany, uh, we're hoping that uh, some people maybe have sent in some questions, and we'll try and uh, and help them out. Yeah, uh, one person had sent one in actually before the webinar even started. They were curious about how to deter chipmunks from their property. Okay, well that's not the, the easiest thing to get rid of. However. Um, one of the one of the deals uh, with with wildlife is if you can do it without you know if, if a homeowner wants to do it um, and possibly do it without you know actually killing the chipmunk um, one of the things you have to realize is, is that if you have the correct habitat there animals are going to show up so if you can make adjustments to the type of landscaping or planning that you have in and around your, your home you might be able to to possibly deter them some of the, for instance, um, if, if you have a lot of mulch and you have a lot of shrubs, you provide that really good cover and uh, burrowing material and, and they're gonna show up. In addition to that, if you have a bird feeder that is nearby and there's bird seed laying on the ground all underneath the bird feeder, well, you've not only provided a place for them to live, you've also provided a place for them to eat. So as usual with most animal problems, if you eliminate the food, you eliminate the problem. So that would be uh, one option. Another one would be to, and again, it's more of a Band-Aid approach, but and it, you know, it's part of an integrated approach, like Zach had said before, is you could try sprinkling things like cayenne pepper, hot sauce, and things like that on plants that they are frequent, frequenting, and uh, you know, they're, they're not going to they're not going to go for that kind of thing. But um, besides eliminating all of your um, your habitat or your landscaping. Uh, chipmunks are kind of a, a tough critter to eliminate completely. Okay. Um, this is a little bit similar. Um, somebody was asking about, uh, they said there's small burrowing animals that are near their house. Some people mentioned there was groundhogs near their house. Um, I'm not sure if the other person might have been mentioning like voles or something like that, but um, how would you get rid of other small burrowing animals that are near the foundation of a house? I don't know if it's similar to what you just described. Well, I mean, it depends on what the species is. If, for instance, if you if it's a mole problem and you're and you're going to see um, the push-ups, which is basically where the the mole is digging through the lawn, and then you're going to see the push-ups of the soil in there. Um, they do make very effective mole traps. They're very inexpensive. They're for the most part harmless to pets because they are pushed down into the soil, so a dog or a cat really can't get into them. And they're more of a pinch type trap, like a like a mouse trap, but it's it's pushed down into the dirt and it has to be put in the in the uh, the tunnel of the mole and it is a you know a killing type trap um, but they are pretty effective uh, for those types of things uh, again sometimes you're you're going to have other animals digging like skunks and raccoons digging up your yard and what they're probably doing is digging up for um, uh, beetles and larvae that are eating the roots so sometimes 
taking care of the food problem, like maybe you have a problem in your lawn that has, that you either have June beetles or things like that in it. And the, uh, the larger, uh, the, the larger animals like skunks and raccoons are coming there to feed on them. So by, again, by eliminating the food, you can sometimes eliminate the problem. Um, you know, anytime that you have human weight, uh, human food out at a garbage can, or, you know, you know, you leave your garbage bags out there and they're not in a can, that's going to draw in all kinds of uh, um, unwanted animals. So really eliminating food normally eliminates the problem. And, and Zach had mentioned before about um, not having uh, cat and dog food just sitting out. Uh, um, that's, a, that's a really good tip is, uh, you know, maybe you have to leave your cats hungry for a day so that when you put the food out there, they eat everything that's in the bowl. And when the raccoon and the skunk shows up, there's nothing to eat and eventually they'll, they'll move on. Okay. Um, can you go back a slide to the USDA office numbers? Some people were asking, they didn't get the time to write that sure. down. Thank you. Um, you can also uh, visit the Game Commission site and look for region office information and look up your county if you're interested in um, some do-it-yourself things and you have to make that report um, to the Game Commission. Uh, some of the questions are, um, can you shoot animals with a pellet gun? Is that legal? I think it would probably depend on what animal you're talking about there, but can you speak to that? Depending on the situation you have, if you're having any small animals or small game as they're uh, classified as, if they're causing actual damage to the property, then protection is taken off them as per the law. Now, again, that doesn't apply to bobcats, fishers, beavers, uh, big game, wild and threatened species. But if you have squirrels or other type of animals that are actually causing physical damage, it's just not a presence, then yes, they can actually be uh, legally taken or harvested or killed. And that's where we would need notify that that, that was, incident was done. Uh, one, one other thing with that is sometimes people, they put out what they call a bird feeder. and and they don't want squirrels coming to the bird feeder. That is not a case of shooting for protecting of bird feed by shooting squirrels. I always tell people there's no such thing as a bird feeder, there's a free feeder. And whatever comes to it is coming to it. So if you don't want squirrels, then figure out a different way to feed the birds or don't feed them, but you can't just shoot squirrels because they're showing up and eating your bird feed. Uh, if it's speaking, damaged to property, it has to, be, it has to be the actual structural damage such as damage to the foundation, the siding, uh, damage to materials or sheds, even um, equipment, uh, that would be damage to property and that's what would uh, incite or enact the availability of them being able to harvest those animals for protection of damage to their property. And they still need to contact the Game Commission. Speaking of the lethal means of getting rid of nuisance wildlife, can you go over again which types of species can be killed and which cannot? Basically, it comes down to, um, I'll tell you ones that can't be, is any big game. So no deer, bear, elk, turkeys, no migratory birds, no federally endangered species. But then we also have ones such as bobcats, fishers, and beavers that we'll take care of or at least assist with them. In regards to what they can use, they can use some of these locally bought traps, as Officer Lynch was saying before about the mold traps. Uh, but if they're going to be using a firearm, then they do a have to be careful of and letting their neighbors know that this is occurring because there are safety zone laws protecting people's properties. Other than that, yes, they can use firearms to dispatch an animal, uh, but there are restrictions of that that's in the game law, 22 caliber or less. Uh, a lot of these people that think that they can use a pellet gun, they're not very uh, effective and ends up wounding the animal. So there are in our game uh, wildlife code specific uh, ammunition or devices that can be used to lawfully and humanely lethally kill the animals. A lot of people are asking, again, for more information about groundhogs. That seems to be a really popular one. A lot of people have them burrowing under their porches and so forth. Can you touch on that again about what they should do with groundhogs? Well, one of the things that, you know, if you have groundhogs underneath a shed, and that's a pretty common thing because that's what they like to do, 
Um, you know, taking care, and, and it's not that easy to do once they've already established that that you know a den site in there, and they're they're having young now, and and so that kind of thing. But if you know if you're going to put up a shed, or if you're going to if you eliminate some of the groundhogs, let's say you shoot the groundhogs, if you can dig down around the outside of that building and put let's say quarter inch mesh down five or six inches down, and then put the dirt or the stones back up against that, you you got to be able to deter the groundhog from making an, an easy excavation underneath the shed they feel completely comfortable underneath the shed so you know that that can be a problem and you, and you want to be really careful you can buy things at, at at stores hardware stores that are like smoke bomb type things and all that kind of stuff you got to be careful that doesn't actually ignite the material that's down in the groundhog nest and then burn your whole shed down so you want to be really careful with those kinds of things um, you know if, if possible depending obviously on where you live if possible, um, and, it, and there isn't a safety zone issue or something like that, you may be able to get a licensed hunter who, who would come and, and take care of it for you. Um, you know, we had, we had also talked about uh, cage traps and, and things like that. There are certain, you know, uh, a little bit safer traps that you can put out that if you happen to catch a non-target like a cat or somebody's little dog or something like that, you basically just let them out of the trap again. You want to be really careful putting any kind of body gripping traps, and a lot of people will do that. They're for the, the square jawed trap and some people call them conna bears but that's simply a brand name you're going to be very careful about sticking them in a hole because you are li you are liable you now have put that trap out and if somebody's pet or something goes in there it's a killing trap and there's no way to get it out in time so you know you really like we had said before in the beginning of this uh, webinar once you set it out you know you, you need to be cognizant about how are you going to remove the animal and is it a a safe implement something that you feel secure doing it uh, you know if you put some sort of trap out you as officer Tehan said you want to let your neighbors know what's going on um, and uh, you know you just it, it's it's a groundhog you know you don't want to end up doing something that ends up hurting neighbor relationships or worse you know yet is breaks the law and uh, so calling the the region office the game commission region office asking a, a dispatcher for a pest control agent or calling USDA for some advice might be a good idea if you're unsure of what to do. Some of you had been asking about that region office phone number. Um, we have a shortened link that's hopefully easy to remember. So if you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash P-G-C and then capital C contact us, capital U, U-S-C-O-N-T, or whatever, contact us, you, you can spell that out. Um, you'll be, be able to find that uh, region information. Um, some other questions were specific to beavers. Um, you had touched on this, but um, that's one that you said that would be for someone with a special permitted license to be able to take care of those, right? Not just a member of the public. Right, again, if someone's having a problem with beaver damage to their property, such as trees or a dam that was created and is flooding the property, they need to call the game commission uh, for an officer to go out and inspect the area. There are some ways of protecting trees, specific trees, uh, with certain types of wrappings that doesn't really take away from the aesthetics of it. They'll keep the beavers from further chewing those trees, but dams are protected and cannot be removed, destroyed, altered in any way unless they get permission to do so. Uh, so that's not something that they can take upon themselves. So for beavers, they need to contact uh, the game commission for advice. You had mentioned um, black vultures. Someone said that they've heard that they can attack uh, young lambs. Is there something that you would suggest as a way to protect those lambs? Uh, the best way to protect any <clears throat> new, newly born uh, domestic animals is in a barn or a, some kind of building uh, where the vultures can't get access to get into. That's the safest. Uh, most productive way of, of ensuring their safety. Um, if that's not an option, um, harassment of those vultures, whenever you see them in the area, uh, things like pyrotechnics, <clears throat> making loud noises, um, basically anything you can think of to scare that bird without harming it or killing it is legal. Yeah, wa water hose, if they're if they're perching on a, um, a fence post or something like that, you can spray them with a hose. Things like that are, are good ways of, of deterring them from your property. What are the rules regarding rabies vector species with uh, live trapping them and moving them? Okay, so if someone live traps 
and whether it be a skunk or groundhog or any of the other rabies vector species, those animals cannot be relocated to another area. And the reason for that is, is that now if that animal does have to have the rabies, they're spreading the disease into an area that it wasn't already present. So the main option for rabies uh, specter VCs is to dispatch them or kill them. If they don't want to do that, they can release them, but it has to be in the immediate area. The problem with that is, is you're pretty much releasing it back in his home range and it's going to come back. So again, if, they're, if they have a problem with skunks or these rabies vector species and they want to take care of themselves, they're pretty much going to have to be uh, willing to dispatch the animal. If they catch a skunk, if they call the game commission and say, I caught a skunk, I want you to come out and take care of it, and that's not the way it works. If they catch the animal, they're responsible for taking care of it and disposing of it or dispatching it. Uh, those animals must be either released or removed or killed from the trap within 36 hours, otherwise that is violation of the law. <clears throat> so again, rabies vector species either have to be killed or released in the immediate area. Uh, they can't be removed to a different location. And of course they have to be careful for themselves, uh, but they, it can be done safely. This time of year, the Game Commission gets a lot of calls about bears causing property damage and um, frequenting uh, homeowners' properties. Uh, what is your suggestion for people to do about nuisance bears? It's kind of a awkward uh, definition of having as a nuisance bear. Uh, basically, a nuisance bear is one that is actually coming into a community or a residential area or farm area and is actually causing damage to livestock or actually breaking into buildings, going after food or storage. Uh, a bear that's coming in for bird feeders or trash or stuff like that, that's a bear that's just acting normally. And that is up to, that's more of a people problem than a bear problem. So we get calls on a regular basis, bear came in, dumped over my trash. We always advise the people to put your trash out the morning of the pickup because they, their sense of smell is, is a lot greater than a greyhound or a bloodhound dog. So they're gonna smell that food source from a long distance, they're gonna come in and it's basically free food for them. Barbecue grills just need to be cleaned off. Pet bowls is a big thing, bird feeders, they come in for that. Uh, so most of our bear complaints are easily, easily uh, corrected or rectified by just, again, eliminating the food source. Uh, if there's a problem with people that have beehives, they can call us. We do have uh, designs meant up for uh, bear deterrent fences around the beehives so the bears won't actually go in and damage. If there's any physical damage to beehives or livestock, they have to call us and we'll come out and inspect the area. Uh, but again, the majority of the time, it's bird feeders and trash. And that's something that can be easily rectified by people just either taking bird feeders in for a couple of weeks, the bear move on, or keep their trash in until the morning of pickup. It sounds like removing those food sources is a really big part of um, hopefully deterring those nuisance wildlife from coming onto the property. So um, we're running out of time here. If any of you have not gotten your questions answered, you're welcome to email us at pgccomments at pa.gov. This session has been recorded and we should you should receive an email with a link to the recording within the next few days. It will also be uploaded on the Game Commission's YouTube channel where captions will be auto-loaded. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in our webinar today. Um, and we appreciate that both our presenters and the audience took time out of their busy schedules to join us. We hope you'll join us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. You can send us an email for a suggestion for a webinar topic if you have one. Until then, we hope you're able to get outdoors and enjoy some of the Pennsylvania's great wildlife experiences.